Sorry for a little bit of delay. So, hi friends, I'm Alan, and today I'll be showcasing to you what are API gateways. So, today we'll explore the different use cases that uh, you can you want to solve with gateways. Then we'll tackle the different uh, implementations, including cloud, vendor, and pluggable gateways. Then we'll also explore when is it good to use a gateway together with containers and functions, since they are like the really hot topic nowadays. And then we'll also take a look at what are common pitfalls associated when working with API gateways. So how many of you guys are familiar with this thing? So yeah, basically it's the International Space Station. So as a kid, I had been always a fan of the engineering teams that had worked with the International Space, Space Station. Because if you think of how large it is, you'll end up wondering, like, how did they build this thing? And a cooler question is that, how did they even flew this thing up there in the sky, right? So apparently, what they had done is that they had split this thing into smaller pieces called modules. And they flew piece by piece up there in the sky. And the cooler thing about this thing is that it was built by separate teams from different countries. And they never spoke about uh, how would they build things internally. Instead, they had work together on how they would integrate things. So in the world of software engineering, the equivalent of this is your microservice architecture, like kind of engineering nowadays. So most of the people would expect that microservices is as simple as splitting your APIs into smaller pieces. But actually, it burdens or it uploads the difficulty of engineering into the consumer-facing applications. Because if you think about it, you now have like multiple retrieval points. You now have multiple attack points for attackers. You now have multiple domain names and SSL certificates. And you have to deal with authentication hell. So when I meant by authentication hell is that you now have to deal with different JWT tokens, different HTTP headers. Let's say you have like nine microservices that are sitting in the back end. How do you deal with them? Like, it's very tough, right? As a front end developer, you are forced to consume uh, multiple APIs that are really split and diverse because they are built by separate teams. So the problems don't really just exist in the front end. Actually, there are more problems that exist in the back end. So are, how many of you guys are familiar with cross-cutting concerns? So when you say cross-cutting concerns, these are like the repeated things that are shared across your different microservices. A sample of this would be logging, rate limiting, your authentication, your caching, rate, uh, monitoring and tracing, and other forms of governance that you want to be implemented in the same fashion across all of your microservices. And to solve these issues, API gateways do exist. So this is like the main use case of why do you want an API gateway. So API gateway is basically a piece of software that sits in front of your microservice ecosystem that handles HTTP traffic and redirects it to the proper backend service that will be in charge of handling that HTTP request. So a common question that I really get about uh, API gateways is, do you mean a reverse proxy? So my answer as a professional and uh, architect is that it's a yes and a no. <laughs> Sometimes it depends. Because actually, reverse proxying is the job of an API gateway, but it's not the simple thing that it does. Like you have so many things that you can plug into it. Uh, and then you can simply gather all your cross-cutting concerns in a single place, so then you don't have to repeat yourself into your lower context services. And uh, one of the things that I really like about API gateways is that if you are implementing a global strategy or an application that is consumed by a lot of people all over the world but doesn't really like require traffic and you want it to be fast, API gateways do help in improving the speed of communication. So let's assume that the cost of communicating between Asia and Europe is 55 milliseconds. And if you have like four gateways or for backend APIs, you will have to call one of the, every single one of them, and you have to pay for each call and multiply it to the number of calls that you require to render your web page. Let's say for uh, our sample, it requires three. So for now, it 
uh, you have to pay at least 165 milliseconds to render your web page. But with the help of an API gateway, since you only have to pay the latency between Asia and Europe once because your gateway is in front of it, you can now derive the cost of communication downwards to 65 milliseconds. So it's quite huge. So actually, NetWix published a case study of how they drive the cost of rendering the main page of Netflix in the web app from 10 MB to 200 KB using an API gateway and GraphQL. So there's a link out there. You can read it after the presentation. So one of the other cool things that I really like about public and I mean API gateway is that it gives you the capability that we didn't really had before. So before you were like obliged to expose your public and private APIs, but with the help of an API gateway, you will be able to do public and private APIs so that you can control or limit the exposure points on your ecosystems. So I like to compare this one as the equivalent of depending your pants from bullies because the more openings you have, meaning APIs you have in front of your application, the more potential attack points that you can actually get. So let's now discuss like the different variations and types of API gateways that you can try. So there are like three of them. And one of them, first of them, is like the cloud provider, so the big three. And then you have like vendor base, which is Kong, API G, and Tide. There are more of them. Then we have your pluggable gateway. So pluggable gateways are basically packages that sit on top of your existing uh, favorite frameworks. Let's say for Express, you have Express Gateway. For Restify, you have Restify Gateway. For .NET, you have Ocelot. For Java, you have Javester. So they are cool because you don't have to make any modifications in your on-prem deployments, you just need to say you have like a local ecosystem for supporting ASP.NET Core applications. You don't really have to make a tweak. You just plug it to your ASP.NET Core project, deploy it like anybody else that were previously deployed and you already have them. So let's now check like what are the pros and cons of using a cloud provider gateway. So uh, cloud provider gateways are generally easy to provision and scale since they are like highly supported by these cloud providers. You can easily integrate them with other services. So for Amazon, if you're using an API gateway, you can easily integrate it with your serverless stack, with your SQS, with your Aurora DB. And then you can also get support for low latency, so low latency communication, meaning if you have AWS gateway, you can use a cloud prompt sit in front of it to drive the communication down to your clients globally. And then, of course, a cloud provider is not just all about fun. There are like cons associated with it. So first one of them is a compliance issue. So nobody in the financing industry is allowed to bring sensitive data in the cloud. And you, it's also like using a cloud-based gateway is also equivalent to having a vendor lock-in, which is like most of us really hate, but hey, if it's easily integratable, if you're a shoestring startup, it's very good because you can easily provision a gateway. And then testing happens on the cloud because you, you, you cannot really replicate this infrastructure locally. So I have a, a bring a simple demo about AWS API gateway, aggregating like downstream functions. So you can get the access of it from the link below. So I built it using a serverless framework. So serverless framework is a cool framework because it allows you to deploy contain, uh, functions on different cloud providers with just minimal tweak. So uh, for this approach, I built a gateway using 25 lines of codes. And it's easily versionable because it's written in a YAML file. So you can guys check it out later. And then, of course, I have Lambda functions. Later, we'll discuss, like, when is it good to aggregate containers and functions together with an API gateway. But now let's move forward to vendor-based providers. So the pros and cons is, like, of course, you have your compliance issues with the cloud. So if you're a bank, if you're insurance, you're not expo allowed to expose data in your public infrastructure. So vendor gateways solve this one by providing compliant, friendly, 
uh, compliance friendly solutions so they allow you to deploy on prem instead of having a gateway that is exposed in the cloud so it's easily integratable because of its because of its plugin architecture and then the concept of having like a vendor gateway is that you need a specialist required for it there's a need additional setup required on your existing stack on your on prem deployments and of course if earlier we have like a cloud lock-in, now we have a vendor lock-in on-prem. So there's another demo that I have written that you can access on the link below. So basically it's running on top of Kong. So Kong is like the most popular API gateway provider out there. It's like that belongs to vendor. The really thing, the really cool thing that I like about it is that it's open source and it's easily migratable into the cloud because it supports Kubernetes ingress controllers. So you, you guys should uh, probably want to check it out. It's really cool. And then I use Conga because Kong is free until you use its nice dashboard and the scaling features. But Conga is like an open source dashboard that will allow you to manage your API. So I have a sample with me. So, so this is Conga. So it will allow you to browse different API mappings that you had. So if you check my local machine. So I have like several containers running locally. So if you check like Kong is aggregating like, oops. Sorry. So this is Conga, guys. So it's basically a dashboard or API management tool that allows me to manage my downstream services that are associated with my Kong cluster locally. So if you check this guy, so where was it like? I have like several Kong containers running on my cluster locally. So with the help of Konga, you can easily manage it using the portal. So yeah. So the Next type of API gateways is your pluggable gateways. So like I said earlier, there are like the NPM packages or NuGet packages that you can add on top of your existing web framework. So the pros and cons of using one is that it's open source usually and it's easily integratable whatever you want to deploy on on-prem or a cloud environment. It's also compliance friendly because you can just deploy it with your existing compliance friendly solutions and it's easily migratable. And then the cons of using one is that uh, you need to have a little bit of uh, development knowledge associated with using these packages. So there's also like a short hive span associated with them. And since it's a framework, you need to lock in with it. And if you want to migrate to a latter or maybe a vendor based gateway later on, you need to perform migration costs. And so there's another demo that I prepared. So it's uh, accessible by the link below. So it's running on top of an Ocelot gateway. So basically it's an ASP.NET Core gateway that allows you to aggregate downstream and up, uh, upstream services using configuration that look like this. So, so yeah, so another question that comes in whenever working with API gateways is that where do, when do I want to work with container and functions in my production system? So basically I think that the difference between them is associated with the traffic that you want to handle. So basically, serverless is better at handling like unpredictable traffic because you only pay for what you need. And if you are uh, 
handling a lot of HTTP traffic is easily scalable because you don't need to worry about provisioning about your EC2 instances. So, and then I think that containers are also good for managing legacy applications. I think if you're a startup nowadays, con uh, serverless is like the way to go because uh, you don't really have to worry about your server and you just let your cloud provider worry about it. And then uh, for a container, you have like latest environment supported. For serverless, you have to worry about uh, accessing like the latest features of a framework. For, so for example, Node.js is a bit uh, lagging when it comes to contain, I mean, serverless support. So in AWS, you can only support like Node 8.10. And I think containers are like the king of on-premise deployment strategies. They are like frameworks for serverless for doing like locally on top of containers, but I don't uh, really prefer doing them. I think that containers should be like used locally since you already have the infrastructure for them. And then I think that one major difference between containers and serverless is that containers are susceptible and good for long running tasks as compared to serverless, which is like good for quick processing trap, I mean, processing quick transactions like HTTP persistence to database. And then let's check out the bad sides of API gateways. So I think that uh, the cons associated when working with API gateways is that there's an additional development cost as because you need to aggregate them as compared to exposing multiple ones. You also have like added latency on top of your existing communication pipes because you need to do some routing locally in your cluster. And then there's also like a, sing uh, a gateway is also treated as a single point of failure. And then you also can treat it as your configuration monolith since before the goal was to split into different business rules into different independent contexts, right? Now you need to split things in, uh, I mean, you need to aggregate things into a monolith, which is like built up by configuration. And then it's a common point of check-in conflict for working developers since like you have multiple teams working with them. Everyone wants a piece of your gateway. So when they push some change on your YAML file, it's always solve the conflict, solve the conflict every single time. So I think that to solve these issues and to work around them, so backend for front ends is actually a good idea to use. So backend for front end is like an approach for using gateways where you deploy a gateway for your consumer application, dedicated for consumer application. So if you have like a mobile application, you have a desktop application, or you have a customer portal, you want to deploy one gateway for it so that each team working on the front end application can release their own application without like affecting the other contexts or other applications. So yeah, that's mostly for my presentation. So any questions? Thanks for this. First of all, I'd like to you show a lot of links there. Will you share the slides? And my main question is, you talk about multiple gateway for each type of service request, like one for mobile application, one for your desktop and all that. Isn't that ad hoc cost and you need to think about all security aspects in each of the gateways? So yeah, actually so this is a very smart question. I think uh, that uh, this designing this, uh, if you want to, it's like, deploy one gateway for each of your consumer application as compared to like exposing a gateway for your own ecosystem. You have to consider like several factors associated to it. So for me, I think you need to weigh like what are the advantages of having like uh, independent things that can release like independent gateways as compared to having like a single point of failure, like what will be the risk associated and the impact of this risk if I deploy my database and it becomes a single point of failure. So I, I think that there's no generally good answer for this one. It's always like a trade-off between the two things that I mentioned. So, uh, like, uh, anybody else like, wants to ask a question? <laughs> 